So in the previous parts of this course, we've talked about uh, some backyard astronomy early on in the course. Uh, we talked about some of the general uh, physical properties for things like gravity, Kepler's laws, properties of light, how light is emitted by different objects. Uh, we talked about some of those general concepts. And then we started talking about the properties of stars. First, our own star, then how we measure the properties of distant stars and uh, the life cycles and different types of dead stars that there are. So now what we're going to be doing in the course is kind of zooming out even more and saying, let's look at the properties of galaxies and eventually first our galaxy, then other galaxies, and then more of the large scale structure going to how galaxies cluster together in certain ways. And eventually zooming out to the largest scales of looking at the universe as a whole, talking about things like the Big Bang and eventually some uh, open questions in the area of astronomy. Uh, but for now, we're going to start by talking about the Milky Way galaxy, our own galaxy. Uh, we are in this Milky Way galaxy, which is a spiral galaxy. And this spiral galaxy has this general shape. So we've got this section in the middle, this disk around the outside. And it's, you know, something kind of like this, where we have this disk structure. And our own uh, solar system is inside of this disk. So if we're inside the disk, if you are in a region where you have very clear skies, um, you know, very low levels of light pollution, you can actually see the disk of the Milky Way galaxy. It's this flat disk, but from your vision, if you have this flat disk tilted on the sky, it's gonna look like it's going from the lower part of a horizon up kind of above the horizon and then back down into the horizon. That gives us this particular disk shape. So we're going to be starting by just talking about the properties of the Milky Way galaxy. So there's three basic parts uh, that we have for the Milky Way galaxy. We have this bulge in the middle. We have the disk. And we have the halo, which is kind of extending all the way around uh, this thing, kind of off the scale to the side of the diagram. All this area is the halo. For our own solar system, we would be about two thirds of the way out in that disk. So we would be around here. And in comparing the sizes of these objects, all of the stars that we can see in the night sky are within about 2000 light years of the sun. For comparison, um, this Milky Way galaxy, the disk, is about 100,000 light years across. So let's label a couple of these distances just so we can get a sense of scale here. So this whole thing is about 100,000 light years across. And we are about, again, two thirds of the way out from the center. And all of the stars that we can see are within about 2,000 light years of Earth. So 2,000 light year radius is what we can see. So even on that clear night when we can see, you know, this whole disk of the Milky Way galaxy, that's just a small part of the disk just around us. All of these stars that we can see um, with the unaided eye are up just in our own neighborhood in the Milky Way galaxy. And this, our galaxy contains somewhere between 100 and 400 billion stars, plus a lot of interstellar dust and gas, especially in the disk of the Milky Way galaxy itself. Again, for this disk, the thickness of that disk is only a few thousand kilometers, or sorry, a few thousand light years. So we're only around, you know, two to three thousand light years. So if you were to look at the kind of relative scales of the width of the disk of the Milky Way galaxy and the height of that disk, it would be pretty similar to like a DVD, uh, you know, the dimensions of a, a CD or a DVD. Uh, but we're going to be talking about each of these parts of the structure 
and identifying some of their general properties. So let's start with the disk. <clears throat> Excuse me. Uh, that disk is about 100,000 light years across and only a couple thousand light years thick. And it contains stars of all spectral types. It's going to have relatively old stars like our sun, uh, things like K and M main sequence stars, which can be quite old. So let me list out some of these general properties. So for the disk, it contains old and new stars. And again, when we're trying to identify the ages of these clusters of stars, earlier on in the course, in one of the earlier sessions, we talked about the properties of main sequence stars. And we said that the high mass main sequence stars, the type O and B main sequence stars, they only last for a very short amount of time, again, compared to the age of our uh, Milky Way galaxy. Uh, the high mass main sequence stars, the O and B main sequence stars, might only last, you know, 10 to 100 billion, sorry, 10 to 100 million years. So these O and B main sequence stars, they're very luminous. They shine with a bluish white color because they are very hot as well. But these stars, if you see some of them, they must have only recently formed in the last, you know, few million years. Whereas the lower mass main sequence stars, and especially those K and M main sequence stars, if those are the only ones that are around, you know that this, that that particular cluster must be fairly old. So again, to identify the ages, to identify ages of clusters, so if we want to ID ages of clusters, um, based on how many high mass main sequence stars are still there based on how many high mass main sequence stars are still there if we see some of those o and b main sequence stars we know it's got to be a very young cluster if the only thing that's left are the K and M stars, we know it's going to be an older cluster. This is something that we're going to come back to a bunch of different times, so it's a, going to be a helpful thing to remember. So how do we identify areas of recent star formation? Well, if we see some of those blue speckles, like on this diagram, if I zoom in on this a little bit, we see a couple of features that highlight new star formation. These blue speckles that we see in parts of this image, those are the O and B main sequence stars, the ones that are very high mass, very high luminosity, and shining with that kind of white bluish color. Um, and if those are around, you know that there had to have, they had to have formed relatively recently. So for signs of star formation, let me uh, write this one down. So signs of star formation. If we see blue speckles. Those are the young O and B main sequence stars. There's another feature on here that signifies main sequence that uh, there's recent star formation going on because these O and B main sequence stars are very, very energetic. They are at a very high temperature. So they're actually giving off lots of ultraviolet light. And what that ultraviolet light will do is if there's a nearby cloud of you know hydrogen gas, the ultraviolet light from that from those O and B main sequence stars, that high energy ultraviolet light is going to excite that cloud of hydrogen gas. So we have these O and B uh, main sequence stars. They're giving off lots of UV radiation. And this cloud of high, primarily hydrogen gas is going to be excited by that cloud. 
And when we looked at the spectrum of hydrogen, we see that when I excite a hydrogen gas, it's going to glow with a very characteristic kind of reddish pinkish color, uh, at least in the visible part of the spectrum. And if we're looking at this cloud of gas, we're going to see this thing be uh, uh, glowing with those particular emission lines from hydrogen gas. So let me write that one down as a comparison point. So we see these kind of pink splotches. Those are ionization nebulas. where nearby young stars have excited the hydrogen gas. Making that leading to uh, the emission lines, emission spectrum. So again, whenever we see a picture of a galaxy, if we see either these blue speckles or these kind of pink splotches, that's a strong indication that there is star formation actively going on in that uh, galaxy. Now, of course, this isn't the Milky Way galaxy. We can't get an image of the Milky Way galaxy looking like this. Again, because we are inside of the Milky Way galaxy and there is no spacecraft that would be able to make it outside of the Milky Way galaxy for a very, very long time, like tens of, like probably uh, hundreds of thousands of years. So this is not the Milky Way galaxy, just to clarify. Uh, this is just another galaxy that has similar properties to our own. So again, talking about the properties of the disk, we have uh, all ages of stars, we see some clusters that have a lot of those O and B main sequence stars, so they're very young. We see other clusters of stars where those high mass main sequence stars have all died off. Uh, so those are going to be older uh, clusters of stars. And the heavy element abundance is about 2%. So again, going back to the disk. Again, we have old and new stars, uh, heavy elements at around 2%. And the orbits of these stars are nearly circular, but what you sometimes also get is, in addition to the uh, stars orbiting around the center of the galaxy, they also have a little bit of up and down bobbing motion as they go around because they're being pulled towards the, uh, the disk. Um, that gravitational interaction will give this kind of up and down bobbing motion through the surface of the disk. It's also got a lot of gas called the interstellar medium. So it's gas rich. And we're going to talk about some of these layers of gas. So when we talk about the gas and dust that's uh, in between stars, we refer to this as the interstellar medium. So I'll change the color of this so we can highlight this. Interstellar medium. So this interstellar medium contains uh, mostly hydrogen and helium gas. It's still the dominant thing that's uh, making up the material in between these stars. But it also has little grains of dust, which have the effect of blocking and scattering light. When we look at the images of these objects, if I can get this to zoom in a bit more, we see some of these regions where light is being blocked, where background stars are being blocked by some of these clouds of dust and gas. So that's why this has a kind of splotchy appearance on the sky. It's not that there's no stars in some of these regions, it's that there's a cloud of dust and gas in front of us, in between us and some of those background stars that's blocking some of our view. So let's talk about this interstellar medium in a fair bit of detail. There are a couple of different layers. So let's talk about these layers. 
we first have this relatively thick layer of atomic hydrogen. So you have a thicker layer of atomic hydrogen. This is at a relatively higher temperature than we're going to see for the next layer. When we have this atomic hydrogen, it's a higher temp. And it's a thinner material. And we can identify specifically this atomic hydrogen. This atomic hydrogen has a very, very special uh, emission line called the 21 cent centimeter radio emission line. So that is literally the wavelength. It's a part of the radio spectrum. And so this is identified identified with that 21 centimeter radio emission. So this is a kind of picture of the disk of the Milky Way galaxy. Again, our perspective is inside of this disk and it is highlighting where we're seeing that 21 centimeter line from atomic hydrogen. We have it mostly in this uh, disk, above the disk and below the disk, we don't see nearly as much of this gas. So that's the first layer. And then we have a second layer, uh, a thinner layer of cold molecular hydrogen. So we have this thinner layer of molecular hydrogen. Remember, when we talked about the uh, stellar classifications, the spectras of stars, we said that molecular features are associated with lower temperature stars. Same kind of pattern here. At lower temperatures, that atomic hydrogen will turn into molecular hydrogen, H2 gas. And those molecules at higher temperatures will break apart. So if you see the word molecular, think, okay, this is going to be a lower temperature for whatever kind of material that I'm looking at. Molecular means lower temperature. So it's a thinner layer of molecular hydrogen. Uh, so this is at a much lower temperature. And it's generally a denser gas. Well, if it's a colder gas and it's more densely packed together, this is going to be the region that is more primed for star formation. So this has the right properties for star formation. Remember that for forming stars, we've got two forces that are always competing with each other. We've got the inward pull of the gravitational forces, and we have that outward push of thermal pressure. So if I want these clouds of dust and gas to start to form stars, to start to collapse under gravity to form stars, the denser that material is and the colder that material is, the more likely that gravity is going to be able to take over and cause this thing to compress. We can identify some of these layers of molecular hydrogen by other spectral lines associated with molecular hydrogen. And we can also use other materials, say carbon monoxide. Uh, carbon monoxide can be used as a basically a molecular tracer to find where these lower temperature gases are. Again, these gases are still primarily uh, molecular hydrogen and helium, but the little bit of carbon monoxide, it has very, very specific radio emissions or, or sorry, spectral line emissions. This is an image of a, a particular nebula looking at the Hubble, tel using the Hubble telescope. And this is the same image looking at those carbon monoxide 
uh, emissions. So we can again highlight where some of those lower temperature gases are. So if we have this kind of model of our Milky Way galaxy, again, we've got this thicker outer layer of atomic hydrogen, which is at a higher temperature. And we've got this thinner inside layer of molecular hydrogen, which is at a lower temperature. And typically, as you go from the outer layers of the disk to the inner layers of the disk, the gases get cooler and they're more dense. On Earth, if I have a low temperature gas, then where does that low temperature gas tend to go in the room? If I have like a, a some low temperature gas, is it going to move upwards or downwards in the room? It's probably going to move downwards. In a similar kind of way, these gases, as the temperature gets lower, it's going to go to where that gravitational field is the strongest. And in this case, for the disk, that gravitational field is going to be strongest if it settles in the middle of that particular um, uh, of that particular layer. It's going to go to where it has the lowest uh, gravitational energy in that case. So again, those are the properties of the disk. We've got old stars, we've got new stars, we've got these different layers of interstellar medium of these different clouds of hydrogen and helium gas. Let's talk about the bulge of the Milky Way galaxy. We're gonna change gears just a little bit. Let's talk about the bulge. This is the region near the center that is very densely packed with stars. So near center, so at the center. more densely packed with stars. For comparison, the nearest star to us is uh, Proxima Centauri, and it's about 4.3 light years away. Well, in the uh in the bulge of the milky way galaxy there might be you know five or six other stars in that region it's it's significantly more densely packed packed uh than is in our region of the galaxy over here uh the galactic center is in the constellation sagittarius but the brightest stars in the constellation sagittarius it's important to remember that we can only see stars that are within about 2,000 light years of us with the unaided eye. We need telescopes to see further than that. So even though the galactic center is in the constellation Sagittarius, the stars of Sagittarius are nowhere near the center of the Milky Way galaxy. All we're saying is that if I want to look in the direction of the center of the galaxy, we look in the direction of those stars of Sagittarius. We'll talk a little bit more about the uh, the center of the Milky Way galaxy in a in another video. But one of the one of the difficulties with actually measuring the properties of the center of the galaxy is that if we want to look from our position here to the center of the galaxy, we're basically looking through the disk of the galaxy, which is very very um, obscured by the interstellar dust and gas. We have a hard time trying to measure the properties of the galaxy, the properties of the center of the galaxy, especially with use if we're trying to use visible light. If we use other wavelengths, if we use um, infrared light and radio waves, we're going to see that we can get a better view of what's going on in the center of our own galaxy. So. Again, we're going to talk a little bit more about the center of the galaxy in another video, but let's move on to talking about the halo of the galaxy. So this halo is a huge spherical volume around the rest of the galaxy. So a large volume. 
surrounding entire galaxy. And this halo is mostly empty space. You know, there's not really much gas in there. Uh, there's very few individual stars, mostly what we see. So we have, you know, no gas in there. And we see these globular clusters that are orbiting around in weird directions. So you have these things called globular clusters. stars orbiting in a variety of directions. And we see these both above and below the disk there. If this is the disk of the Milky Way galaxy, some would be kind of coming in this way, some are orbiting in this way. Again, it's kind of a whole mix of different kinds of orbits. Though we do see more of these globular clusters when we look more towards the center of the galaxy. So if we're looking towards the center of the galaxy above and below the disk, we see more of these globular clusters uh, being more common in this case. So what are these globular clusters? Well, these globular clusters are huge clusters of stars that are all gravitationally bound together and they can contain tens of thousands to millions of individual stars. So these globular clusters are huge clusters, uh, tightly packed clusters of stars. The stars that we see in these globular clusters are mostly type K and type M main sequence stars. So mostly K and M main sequence stars. So if they're mostly K and M main sequence stars, what would we say about the ages of these globular clusters? Pause the video for a second and think about that one. If they're mostly just K and M main sequence stars, what can we re reasonably say about how old they are? Are they relatively new or are they very old? So this is an example. Omega Centauri contains around 10 million stars in a sphere only about 150 light years in diameter. Remember, there's a hundred, sorry, there's 10 million stars in that area. And again, for us, from one star to the next can be around, you know, four or five light years. So this is much more densely packed. But getting back to that question of if these are mostly K and M main sequence stars, that means these clusters must be very old. So they are very old. Basically, all of the all of the other main sequence stars, all of the higher mass main sequence stars have all died off. There's another way that we can identify that these clusters are very old is that they don't have very many uh, heavy elements. So the heavy elements, those abundances are only around 0.02% much, much lower amounts of heavy elements than we see in stars in the disk of the Milky Way galaxy. And the idea is that these star clusters must have formed very early in the history of the galaxy, basically before earlier generations of stars had a chance to actually make some of these heavy elements. Hmm. We've talked a little bit about how heavy elements are formed inside of stars and then dispersed by those stars at the end of their lives, whether they uh, are low mass stars ending as a planetary nebula or high mass stars blowing away that material as a supernova. If these stars all formed before that cycle could occur, well, they might just not have very many heavy elements there. We're gonna talk about this in more detail uh, in the next video. But just to finish off kind of talking about the halo, 
there's little to no gas in the halo or in these globular clusters. So there's basically nothing to make stars out of. Uh, in the halo, we don't see any signs of star formation. There's no O and B main sequence stars. There's none of these... Um, there are none of these ionization nebulas of, you know, clouds of gas that are getting excited by nearby high energy stars. Um, again, if there's no gas there, what are you going to make the stars out of? Again, these globular clusters can orbit the Milky Way in elliptical orbits with random orientations. And all these things together are going to point to the idea that these halo objects likely formed very early in the formation of the Milky Way. Well, uh, we're going to be talking about uh, galaxy formation later on. Uh, in one of the next videos, we're going to talk about in more detail about this star gas star cycle and how the role that the galaxy plays in forming new generations of stars and why the disk of the Milky Way galaxy is especially important for forming new generations of stars. So that'll help us compare and contrast more of these properties between the disk and the halo, and later on, more of the properties of other kinds of galaxies. So we'll be doing that in one of the next videos.